Julian Woodall, back on the podcast. Uh, f- number two. Number back two. on the podcast. Nearly two years after your first first appearance. First off, let's crack the... Uh, let's crack Sainsbury's finest uh, galactic milk stout. A- alcohol-free. I'm going to hold it up the camera. Hold up alcohol-free. The camera. And uh, it's by the Big, Dro- Big Drop Brewing ca- uh, Company. It's a ra- it was a random buy, mate, Sainsbury's this morning. I thought... It was in. Do you know what it was in? The wellness fucking section. Galactic. I was. Milk I was not in the wellness stout. section for well. I was looking on the opposite side of the aisle. It was a wellness section, and I, I thought <laughs> milk stout. That'll make. That'll make Woody chuckle. <laughs> my, my granddad and grandma used to drink stout. Mm. They used to drink. Uh, the got no idea. I got no idea what it's going to taste like. Mackey the wellness stout. section. Mackey not stout. Oh my god! Let's, let's try this. Yeah, cheer, mate. Oh, go. lying bastards! Oh. <laughs> 0.5%. 0.5% alcohol. Yeah, but surely if you've got an, a, 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 um, an allergy, alcohol allergy, that would impact you. Would you not get like a rash or something? Well, if you had an impact of an alcohol allergy, you should probably just get drunk. Yeah. After 20 cans. <laughs> yeah, right, let's have a taste of it. Listen, cheers. Oh, that tastes like, um, well, it's non alcoholic stout. It tastes like you ever heard of Rock Sober? No. They're uh, they're they're um, an alcohol free like co- a cool sort of hipster alcohol free brand that set up a couple of years ago actually in London. To a couple of uh, guys who were they worked in the city in finance, um, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, binned it off and set up Rock Sober, and Sainsbury's Galactic Milk Stout tastes just the same. But there's his cooler brand. It's a, um, I think it's an acquired taste. It's it's like the old in the old um, Russian packs. Remember the Lancashire hot pot, <laughs> boiling the bags. <laughs> you've been there on a patrol for two weeks, and it's the final thing you've got to eat at your rat pack, Lancashire hot pot. It's like that. I've got nothing else. I've got the Lancashire hot pot there. Bring that mic in. You fucking remember that. Yeah. Oh, you moved to the mic. You've moved back, haven't you? Oh, you can sub cheer it, whatever you want to do. Is that better? Yeah, but it's not going to hurt you. I know. Oh, there you go. Good. Uh, okay. Right. Question Question one before we get on to the actual subject matter of the podcast is, have you have you set up an Uber account yet? Mike Valance is asking. <laughs> well... The other week, I did. Mike Valance didn't ask. I'm asking you. You're like it, and no, I haven't. I I do need to. <laughs> I do need to set up. Never, and uh, listeners, just a quick one. <laughs> Don't try to set up a new account after you've had copious amounts of wine, because everything Uber comes up, and we you now need reading. The glasses and it's going off all over the place and you're pressing Uber Eats and Uber God knows what and Uber everything. I could not actually work it out. But I will set up one as a Christmas obviously present uh, to myself. <laughs> In fact, now I'll, I'll do it on my birthday, my 53rd birthday. When's your 53rd birthday? Next month. When? When? The 3rd of December. Is it? I'm 40 in, I'm 40 in two weeks' time. It's great being 40. I remember it well. Why is it great? Oh, it is. It's a good age. If you keep well, it's not as good as thirty. It's not as good as thirty-nine, is it? Well, it's no, worse. If, if you keep every age, you, no, no, no. Every, how do you? Every age you go up, it's worse than the year before. So forty may be a good age, but only compared to forty-one. What are you talking about? Right, you do what I do. Have a look at the people who are the actual the same age as you, the famous people, and that's how I look at it. I think, do you know what? I'm the same age as this person, you, oh, and I'm okay, still in I've good got, shape. I've got questions here. Why? How are you aware of what age celebrities are compared to you? Because what you do, you Google it. <laughs> Should we have a look? Let's have a look. Um, <laughs> Daniel Craig is 53, if I remember uh, correctly. Um, and I'm the same, I'll be, be the same age um, next month as Daniel Craig. Celebs who are 40. That's it. Uh, Hugh uh, Jackman, he's about 52. I'm Jessica Alba. Oh, I'm not doing as well as her. This is going pear shaped. <laughs> Elijah Wood can't stand him. <laughs> Meghan Markle, <laughs> she's forty. Not doing as well as her. Get that one. Brit- Britney Spears is thirty nine. Born December second. Um, Paris Hilton. Jesus Christ! 
My generation is mental. Paris Hilton, Britney Spears, Meghan Markle, Jessica Alba, Elijah Wood, Justin Timberlake. I've got... Justin Timberlake. Hang on, I haven't finished. Alicia Keys, Tom Hiddleston, Chris Evans, Amy Schumer, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Rami Malek. Got time for him. Daniel... Danielle Fischel, never heard of her. Jennifer Hudson, Alex. These are all people who are 40, right? not born on my birthday. Hayden Christensen, Pitbull. <laughs> Je- no, he's a dog in Jesse Williams, Julia Stiles, Bryce Howard, Serena Williams, Zoe. Mate, they're all. I'm not doing as well as any of them. So that blows your theory right out of the fucking water. Anyway, anyway, anyway we digress. We digress. Tell me, right. You obviously just been on a cold it's uh cold it's trip. Yeah. Which one to. Why is cold it's all of a sudden caught your attention, right? It's obviously a famous name to you, but I know I'll be honest, I know nothing about it, right? Okay. What is it about cold it's and the escape? Oh my god, it's it's belched right in the microphone. Mate, it's the old milk stout. <laughs> that is that is fascinating to you. Well, it was April um, of this the year. I done. It was, you know, lockdown and all that. I thought I'll stick in a war movie. So I thought I've not watched the um, Cold It story in years. So I put it on. Uh, John Mills, who who um, plays um, um, Pat uh, and the Reed, who I'll explain about in a bit. And all of a sudden, I thought, we've obviously been in a lockdown since March the, I think it was the uh, 23rd, 2020. These guys were in a lockdown from 1940 until 1945 in Colditz, in uh, prison in Colditz. So <clears throat> I watched it. And I'm not on a holiday in years, and I thought, you know what? I fancy a holiday, but with a difference. I'll go um, to Coldidge Castle and have a look at it. You know how to treat yourself, don't you? I do, yes, I do. So it was just something spontaneous, something uh, different. So I started, and I watched that. I, I Googled stuff on called it and I started getting all the books and the more I read into the called it story and about the actual castle and the escapes the more I um, became in, uh, intrigued by it wanting to know actually more about it and more about it and that's where it all come from and it, 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 it went from a spontaneous idea in April like watching a war movie, and everyone has a movie on, don't they? And we have a movie on, and some obviously people think, I won't mind actually doing that myself. But I put the movie on, and I thought, D- do you know what? I'll actually treat myself, and I'll have a little trip, and I'll do that. And it started off just having a trip. Then it started off, well, instead of just going out to cold it, having a look at the museum, spending a the night there, spend a few nights, why not? go on the same um, escape route into actually Switzerland. So tell me about Colditz. What is the story of Colditz? It, it starts off as a castle. And it is a castle. And it was a hunting lodge. And it's in... It's it's near Leipzig in Germany. And it's... That north, it, south? It, it? It's north. Okay. Just it, It's north, but it's um, south of Berlin... And it's near the uh, Polish border. Okay, my ge- my my not, my German geography yeah. is terrible. And it's in an area called uh, Saxony, and it's got the it's right on the banks of the um, the River Mulder, and it's high up, and you could see it for miles around. And in the First World War, it was a prisoner war camp, <coughs> but no one had ever escaped from it. So after the war, it was a hospital. But then, once 
all the war started again in 1939, it turned then, once again, into a prisoner war camp. But it's going to be a special camp. I know it was called Offlag 4C, Colditz. Now, to get into Colditz, you had to do an escape exam. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Say that again. You have to do an escape so exam. You mean to be a staff member? No, not a staff member, a prisoner. You had to do what they actually called an escape exam. It was a bad boys camp. It was a Sonderlager. What did the exam consist of? So, in 1940, when um, Pat um, the Reed who was Royal Army Service Corps, which is now the RLC, and Airy Neve, he was artillery. They got caught at uh, Dunkirk, okay? What you had to do to get in to, in, uh, to cold it, you have to have escaped from two other um, prisoner of war camps. And that was seen as being a bad boy. In the eyes of the Germans? In the eyes of the Germans. Okay. So... What do you do with all of your um, eggs that are bad? You stick them in one basket. So, Colditz Castle was going to be where all the bad boys went, as like a, you're a fouled escaper, you're going um, to Colditz Castle. That you will not escape from, because in the First World War, no one escaped um, from it. So what about the exam? The exam was, that was it. You had to break out of two camps. Oh, okay. So it's like qualifications. It was a qualification. You had to, you, you had to be qualified to get the cold lips. You had to do uh, two escapes. <laughs> but the thing is, if you've got all these guys who are Army, Navy, Air Force, who've escaped from other camps, they've gone a certain distance if you get what I mean. Some were caught it's still in Germany, some were caught in Poland, some were caught on the Swiss border. They got um, put into cold it's. But then all they do is actually debrief each other. How far did you get? I got there. Well, how come you uh, got caught? All, all the paperwork's changed. There was one guy, a Dutch officer, and if you got caught escaping out of a prisoner of war camp... You're actually sent back. If you look at all the war movies, all the prisoners who were caught out of that camp are sent back to the same camp. And look at him. He's a failure. That's how the Germans are thinking. Yeah, put them all in one place so they can debrief each other. That's one of the, uh, that's one of the ways in which they reckon a couple of the... Of the Islamist Islamist extremist groups have been I don't know, I think Al-Qaeda came about like that I think ISIS came about like that because yeah. of things like Guantanamo Bay we got all the lunatics in the same place and able to communicate I mean not all the time but able to communicate yeah and um another and like and the big camps in um maybe not Guantanamo Bay is a bad example but certainly big camps in Iraq for example yeah you stick all of these brains because they're brainy people in there and they can come up with the, the next crazy idea when they leave you know oh yeah all these escape artists in there a dutch officer got us close got uh, to a place called uh, zingen and i've been there which i'll explain later and this was 1940 and the germans <coughs> was that confident they would win world war ii a german officer who actually questioned him, said, if you'd have gone 300 metres through that wood, no, um, um, 300 yards through that wood, you'd have got over the Swiss border. So when he got sent back uh, to Colditz, you normally did a 20-day or a 30-day um, solitary confinement. Straight away? Straight away. A solitary confinement. As soon as they had come out of that, escape officer gets me in, and the Dutch officer told them this. <laughs> if you go 300 yards, don't go that way, go that way, right, you'll end up over the border in Switzerland. It's not marked, and there's no sentries, and they go straight over the border. 
So did what happened in Cold It's then, was it a mass escape? No, it wasn't a mass escape. That that mass escape, that happened in March 19... Or I need to get this right, 1943. So when you say that mass escape, I've got no idea. I just was guesstimating, so... Uh, the, the Great Escape. That was, was that Cold It's? No, that was oh. Stalag Luft Three. That was at Zagen, which is now in Poland. Cold it had... They uh, uh, tried a group of 12 and they uh, got caught. The reason why they got caught was because they they used to, in Germany, no one had obviously chocolate and stuff like that. So what they used to do, these guys would actually bribe a guard. They'd say, oh, you know, I've got some spare chocolate here. And they told the guard. And what they did is actually um, build a tunnel in the, the uh, canteen. Built it. Uh, to go out and they said over to the guard if you can look an opposite way <coughs> um, bless you if you can look an opposite way we'll obviously give you 100 um, um, Reich marks and what he did he told Germans so as they uh, came out of the hole they had a hatch as they obviously came up they uh, got caught what they worked out was it was best escaping in obviously twos and fours. And some of the stuff they actually, it, it was ingenious how they actually escaped. Go on. Well, Aaron Eve, his first attempt um, failed. And his um, second attempt. Was this via a tunnel? Yeah. No, he walked out. Hang on, talk me through this, Woody. Come on, you can't. Go on. He walked out the camp gate. How did he manage that? What he did, all the Dutch army uniforms were sold by the Germans in 1939. So they looked uh, just like the German uniforms. What they used to do is, is obviously turn off his service clothing into uh, um, civilian clothing. So they got a Dutch army jacket cardboard and boot polish but made a belt <coughs> out of cardboard made a holster used uh, Dutch army trousers for the German boots they it was all officers in cold deeds who wore in those days um, the brown boots so they uh, blackened up all their boots and the Germans had high boots like um, um, the riding boots they made... So, sorry, so the, so the Dutch prisoners were all officers and they had brown boots? All officers in cold it. It's all officers. The prisoners? Yeah. all prisoners. Yep, but all the prisoners. German officers, they had black boots? Yeah, the German right. officers had obviously black boots. So what they did, they had um, high boots, they called them, or jack boots. To imitate the German boots, they got cardboard and they made it black. And the boot polish again. They got the old army service caps, used metal, melted it the down, and made cap uh, badges. Then what they did underneath these obviously jackets was um, civilian obviously clothing. We got the prisoners' courtyard. So you get from the, you have to you've got to get from the prisoners' courtyard into what they call the uh, common uh, uh, danchier. <clears throat> the main German quarters. To do that, there was a theatre. Above the theatre, uh, sorry, and below it, that was an empty room. The next room down was the German officers' mess. So what they uh, decided on uh, doing, getting in, going from the theatre under the floorboard into the empty room, which then has got a staircase going into the German officers like mess. What they had to do was with um, the bravado is walk out of the German officers mess because if any guard saw them seen coming from the German officers mess going across the actual castle courtyard and there's two gates. You've got a main gate there as a guard room. You go through the through that main gate but then over the bridge of the moat there's another gate so what they did 
I think it was that was d- 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 March 1942. Was it January? On the two, they got in, walked out to the German quarters as officers, walked up to the German guard, and saluted him. Went through that gate, that gate shut. And there used to be a gate off um, to the left-hand uh, side. They went through that little gate, over the moat, over the barbed wire, then walked along the street off uh, to the left. And all this stuff is still there. They went then through another gate, which is not there anymore. By this time, all the cardboard's getting a bit obviously soaking wet. <laughs> Then past the German quarters, which is on the actual left-hand side, they then got out, and it leads on to a street. Then took off the actual field caps, stuck them under a bush, took the jackets off, stuck those under a bush, and they used to wear a cap like that. It was called, in those days, a, a gold blimey yeah, man's hat. you say a cap like that for people listening. Okay, so I've got on a, a gold blimey man's cap. Um, if you... It's like Peaky Blinder cap. That's it, what it's like. It's, it's a, a Peaky, Peaky Blinder cap. cap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They made all those uh, all those uh, caps out of um, the blanket they're ticking. You know the old army ah. blankets? It, it was made out of that. One of the guys in Colditz, he made a sewing like a uh, m- machine out of wood. So they walked past there. They walked from there to a place called Leisneg, then caught the train from Leisneg uh, um, to Leipzig as uh, civilians. And then other train journeys. And they got over at the Swiss border. So they got out then? They got out. Oh yes, uh, they they were how they got out of ways is amazing. That was our first home run. It was called a home run ever. Uh, no, from Colditz. From Colditz. The, the, the first ever British home run from Colditz. From Colditz, uh, the first ever British one, Erin Eve. So did they? So what about the tunnel? That got obviously found out. But they then built another tunnel. This is after this, the home run, right? This yeah. is after the first home oh, run. Oh, yeah. There's all loads of tunnels. How were they building a the tunnel, though, in the fucking canteen? When I'm assuming, when they was, I know you said they, they, got, they would get the guard to turn a blind eye inside, but uh, what the balls to do that. Oh, my God, it was amazing. Away. Did you see the tunnel? Uh, yes. How big are we talking, mate? We're talking, I, it's, we had a look at the French one. They found the French a tunnel in uh, 2003. What do you mean they found the French tunnel in 2003? A digger um, collapsed it in. They had a little digger close uh, to a wall, and all of a, s- a hole opened up. And the tunnel led into a former storeroom, and it had been a, um, a I think it was a wine a cellar. And the French were going in, and they used to steal tools. They got camp electric and all lights going, or a fat lamp. And the fat lamp, it was in like an old baked bean tin, with loads of wax and a piece of uh, cotton, and they would dig. And I'm not joking, if this thing had ever collapsed in on them, it would have killed them. Right, right, and... They used to have like a stooge system as well. A what system? A stooge. What's that? But like if anybody, any German obviously guards uh, came along, they'd obviously have a have a whistle or a tune or something like that, or 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 just go open a book. I'd so a person a that's seen that opening a book, another one would go thumbs up or thumbs down. How long, how uh, cold it's, how far did the tunnel have to go? What kind of distance are we talking? Well, the thing is about obviously cold it, it was built on obviously sheer rock. So a few of the tunnels, they, the actual, um, the French one took a nine or ten months. 
of going through rock, chiseling away at it. So they then had to think of other ways. When a uh, pat or uh, a reed got out the night of the 13th and, th and the 14th of 1942 in the October, he dropped out of the window with three other guys, ran across the courtyard, crawled um, behind some uh, bushes, and there was a potato store. They uh, picked the lock of the uh, potato store because another thing they were actually doing is like nicking the keys and making the copies of them. And there's a, a story goes in 93, they were doing a tour of the castle. And the two guides said, Unfortunately, I can't obviously get in here because I don't have a key for it. And a little old man went, have a try of this. Opened up. He said, she said, how did you get that? He said, I was a prisoner here. I made it. Nah. Yeah. It, they were that ingenious. But they got in um, to the, um, um, the potato store. They came across an opening about that big. Like two, like foot and a half by a foot. Yeah, it a cul de sac, and they couldn't go back now, so they started uh, chipping away in it. At it, the only way to get through it is actually strip off naked. So what they did is stripped off naked, and they had to go out backwards that way. So if you imagine, you've got a hole up there, they had to crawl through naked. Right, one of the guys was a bit portly, and you had to to be pulled through so they took off all the clothes shoved them outside then crawled through I think it took them something like four hours and these guys were like what to go through the hole yeah just that little gap yeah determined uh, to escape but the funny story is opposite where they actually came out there was a house and the man he's now a very old man who lives in it when those four guys escaped. He saw them escape. He's only a little boy. And he told his mum and dad, I've just seen um, four naked men <laughs> crawl out of a hole at the castle. And they said, don't tell the lies. It's, it's not right. And it was them escaping. But he said, look, you know, I've seen f um, four naked men. How big is the castle? It's massive. Go, but quantify it. Go. <sighs> I'd say it's, well, I don't know, I'm not too obviously good on obviously meters and well, stuff. Well, compared to Kenilworth Castle, for example. Kenilworth, it's about, it's larger than that. It's larger than that. any more specific than that? It's, um... Windsor it, Castle, compared to that? Well, I've never been there. It's, they say, it's, it, it's about the same as uh, Kenilworth, I'd say. But it's more robust. Mm. Well, Kenilworth's falling apart. Yeah. I mean... This is just, you can see why all the Germans actually thought it was escape proof. And every time an escape happened, that actually changed all the tactics. Did Colditz have an existing tunnel system anyway from previous? Only the drains. Some of them had to go up to natural drains as well. On the outskirts of the castle, it was a green field and it was the exercise area and it had a manhole cover and the Dutch officers this one day are um, all in a circle it's a Bible class and there's apparently a Dutch officer who had a cloak on with a big beard the black beard and he kept um, fidgeting and what they'd done they'd got all to the manhole cover unscrewed all the bolts and made the bolts with out of glass and then painted them. Glass? They somehow found some glass and made them. What would happen in the... Do you know, I don't know if you know, but what, what would happen, for example, at Colditz in the aftermath of an escape within the camp? What had happened was... This is... This is now actually quite interesting. All all of the... They would have a thing um, called an appell, a 
a roll call. How, what was the word you used? A- appell. Appell. Okay. A p p e l. And they'd have a, a roll call, and they had a system where they'd actually do a count. And what they'd do is one, two, three, four, and then a person had a drop down, run, and then stand up another place and stick on a cap or yeah. something like that. And the Dutch officers actually made a dummy. And there's a photo of it. And it was a lifelike uh, dummy. So they'd, they'd actually march out with a dummy and stand there with a dummy. And hope that the German officer counting would not notice it was a dummy. Yeah. And if the actual Germans caught prisoners out, they use a code word, mousetrap, so the home guard, the um, the police and army, and actually go out searching for them. Oh, yeah, it was quite um, ingenious how they got out. Another guy, he vaulted over with the fence. A French guy did. They were doing, it. Yeah. They were doing leapfrogs. And his mate... They were like, you cup your hand. What, what do you mean they were doing leapfrogs? What you know, mean? a leapfrog. You know, a person's bent over yeah, you've, and they jump yeah, yeah. over the back. Yeah. You kept doing that, doing that. Just messing about. Yeah, of, so yeah. you know, no, no, it was exercise. You so know, the guards would not think anything of yeah. it. Yeah. You know, on the old assault courses, you can get a wall and you do that. You know, Put your hands together. Step have out, your hands yeah. together. What they did was, over the fence... 10 foot fence, barbed wire across the top of it. His mate stood up against the fence. The German uh, guard just uh, stared at him. He did that and he threw put him over the top of the fence. His lap, and he vaulted his, over. Put his hands, so so that, that drill you do up against the wall, you yeah. kneel down, you put your hands on your thigh, and your mate jumps up, steps onto your hands on, on his thigh, and then he f- chucks you over. He, he did got that. over the fucking fence like that. He got over the fence like that. He did a runner. He nicked a bicycle. He cycled all the way uh, to Switzerland on it. <laughs> In a pair of trainers, a pair of daps, as we used to call them, a pair of socks, a pair of shorts, a shirt, and a tank top. Crazy. Another guy, ever they come out of the exercise area, that his squadron leader called uh, Padden, and his nickname was uh, Never a Dull Moment. And they're coming out of the exercise, he was a British prisoner. And there's a group of them, and they, apparently this blonde, gorgeous German Fraulein is walking past. And they all said, oh yeah, how are you? And all right, and she was all snotty nose, ignored him. Anyway... She uh, dropped her watch. So I um, padded and picked it up. I'm full line, uh, your watch. And she's going, no, 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 it's your watch, it's your not watch. The German guard got uh, suspicious. Starts taking interest because these German Aussie women's going, no, no. So the German starts talking uh, to her. Then realised that she couldn't speak any any German, and then she happened to be a he, uh. a lieutenant Abule of the um, the French army. His um, the wife had actually sent him a blonde wig and a pair of stockings from home, and the French officer who um, vaulted over with the wire, when they searched his quarters afterwards. He put all his stuff in a box and saying, can you mail it to <laughs> so-and-so, so-and-so in France? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Necky bastard. Oh, God, yeah. So what did you, what was your plan? When you went to Cold this October last year then, what did you do? So did you follow um, the... This year. Uh, this year? This year. Last month, this year. Last what week. did you do? Was well, you plan to follow the escape route of the... Yes. So you started at Colditz, obviously. Yeah. What did you do before you got there? Did you go straight there? What I did, I got a, 
Oh, I got a flight from Birmingham to Berlin. Then from Berlin, I got a train to a, a place called uh, Trandorf. And I got there, and it was an abandoned railway station. When I mean abandoned, abandoned, and you're thinking, oh, I could go off at the right bloody stop here. Uh, and there's a bus stop, and I got a bus um, to Colditz. And you walk up, I must admit, I had a lump in, in like my throat because all the prisoners came in by a train, and the station's now closed at the Colditz. And they were marched all through all the streets up there. And it was a psychological thing because you've got this big, massive castle, Schloss, as it's called in Germany, Schloss. And as you go up there, and you go through that one gate, and then another gate, and then you've got the guard room, the other guard room, and then you've got the after prisoner's courtyard, and that's it. And it's now a youth hostel. It's now a youth hostel. The station? The the uh, castle's a youth hostel. Oh. So I stopped it. Is he it. really? It's a youth hostel. No way. Yeah, it's a youth hostel, and it's also so a music academy. So I stopped in the actual German quarters. But it was everything that I wanted it to be. So your, sorry, so your room in the youth hostel was where the German quarters were? Yes. When it was a... And it was bunk beds, and it was great. Because I had a little table, four chairs, and these bunk beds. It was obviously en suite as well, but I wouldn't have had that in obviously World War II. <laughs> but it was everything I could have wanted, because I wanted to get in uh, to the mind of the actual prisoners. So um, one of the things as well was I decided I, I'd eat what... All the prisoners ate, which wasn't much. So they were allowed um, two bottles of beer every night. Yeah. Two can rule. Two can rule. Yeah, I remember those days. The two can rule. I had on the first evening um, potato soup and two uh, sausages and some bread. And and, um, the breakfast was actually more than a prisoner had because I had two um, the rolls with uh, two slices of the cheese and uh, two slices of ham and a mug of coffee. They would have a bowl of oats, say, and Ertz coffee. Ertz uh, coffee is made out of acorns, okay, and it was black coffee with no sugar in it. How do, how do you make coffee from acorns? I haven't man? got a clue, but, but apparently that's So there's the no Germans. coffee beans in it? No, no, no. It was World War Two, remember. Well, I don't know. Yeah. But I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, acorns. Yeah. Apparently it was made out of acorns. Jesus. I have to look that up after oh. this. So I was on that. I mean, I lost weight. And the steps up uh, to the third floor where I was stopping was like that. And Steep. I, went, Steep. I went over to the museum on the Friday. So I walked all the way down the steps over to the museum. And they said... Have you got your COVID vaccination certificate? So I had to walk all the way back and all the way up again to get my certificate. How many walk steps are there? Oh my steps? God, I don't know. There was a few. Trust me, the old, <laughs> the old quads were burning. After I had my uh, tour on the um, Saturday morning, and there's only two of us on it, which is absolutely great. On the Sunday, that was the escape day. So I'd had, you know, normal obviously um, the breakfast, and I took a, I took a roll as well, and I had um, um, two little uh, pieces of chocolate. But according, in Airy Neve's book, when he escaped, uh, and this, this is the dude who walked out with yeah, all the cardboard on. Yeah, right. As he escaped, when he was at the station, he pulled out a bar of chocolate. The Germans hadn't had any chocolate since 1940. He stood out. So I was not uh, trying to actually play it, but experience what they've experienced. So I've only had now, obviously, two meals a day. I had a, a soup thing I like one evening. So I've only had, like, obviously, two meals a day. 
on the actual morning, I thought, right, I'll walk out the front of the gate and then I take a left. Then on the um, the bus in, I see the road sign saying a Lysnig. So, right, I know that um, the, um, the route. The plan started going downhill from when I got uh, to the front gate. Did you get lost? They were shut. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to about turn, go out to the back gate and past all the guards' quarters, up a hill, then I took a left. Down what time was this? What time did you set off? Look at eight o'clock in the morning now. I'd had breakfast. Well, a bit of it. Off I went. And the first thing I saw was this um, the road uh, goes all the way uh, um, through a wood. And I do hill, obviously, walking over the Morven Hills and all that sort of stuff. And I've got woods near me. And all of a sudden, I started thinking, are there any wolves around here? I can't remember. And I remember it was late. I put it on, obviously, Facebook. And about five people stuck onto Facebook that basically there's wolves in that area. And I don't mean the bloody football team either. And I reached the, the Lysneg turn off and I took it. And all the prisoners skating uh, twos or ones. But one of the prisoners, he, he escaped as a one. He got a lift off a German officer. And he spoke um, fluent uh, German. But it's, it's quite lonely. Because as you go in, as you walk obviously past houses, it was now a Sunday morning, you walk obviously past, all the dogs are barking. And the prisoners, right, it, 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 this is out in all the middle of nowhere. All you can see is all the German off planes. So I got uh, to Leisnick, and that was eight miles away, and got there. And I had to go over um, uh, to the Barnoff, which is obviously German f f for station. Now, when I'd actually done a bit of research, I was supposed to, I was supposed to take the 1530 train, you tied on the train line, from Leisnig to Leipzig. Then I was going to get an overnighter down to Singen. When I got to the station at 11 o'clock, I found it. And what, I'm, what all the prisoners didn't do is actually be a grey man, not standing out, not obviously talking. So you don't want an empty platform, but you don't want a full one. So... I got there, and he said, a train to Leipzig, 11 o'clock. He said, so I jumped on it. And the first mistake I made was, I'd actually walked across a field. And as I sat there, on the train, in all this outfit I've got on now, now I've got a brown obviously pair of boots on, a blue um, a pair of trousers, and a roll neck or a jumper, and my core blimey man's hat. So were you trying to dress like a prisoner? Yes. Okay, go on. Get in that mindset. Yeah, mindset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the actual boots I got were the closest I could get to 19, obviously 40s boots. They weren't built for walking long distances, I'll put it that way. So I'm on there, and this German guy is staring at my feet. And I looked down, and there were mud splatters where I walked across the actual field. So I cleaned them off. So I got Urza Leipzig. Luckily, I speak a bit of German and bought a roll and I stuck it in um, um, to my bag, hid it away. So I got, then I bought a ticket, the same as Erin Eve did, Leipzig to Ulm. So I bought a ticket over um, to Ulm. I did by train 627 kilometres. So I got there. And it was straight, it was history sort of like repeating itself because sat opposite me was actually two German Alpine Corps guys. Nah. Army. Were yeah. they in uniform? Yeah, in uniform. Idolf Weiss and their hats. The, the German uh, um, the paratrooper got on as well. And also a cavalry guy. Now, a prisoner, on like returning back over to the UK, there was a a unit called MI-9. Uh, they were in charge of escaped prisoners, so they would actually interview them. 
who did you see? What units? So I'm sat there and I kept quiet. <clears throat> you know, if you're like me, a chatterbox, and you talk to people on trains, yeah, you know, anyone, yeah. You know, but as a prisoner now, it's not obviously, you know, uh, 2020, it's 1940s. They couldn't talk uh, to anybody. He's staring out of the window. Then I did another screw up. I went to get a coffee. They didn't have any coffee. I to have a cup, have a tea. And I sneezed. So in Germany, they say, uh, Gesundheit. What's the direct translation? Don't know. Oh, uh, bless you. Okay. I went and said out aloud, excuse me. Not a good thing. But not too bad in obviously... Uh, 2021 in 1941 he wouldn't have been too good so after reading obviously Pat Reed's book on this journey Pat Reed did almost exactly the same he went with a, an RAF officer called um, Harvey I think he got his train obviously tickets he turned around in this German station and shouted out the top of his voice, Harvey, I've got the tickets. And he said, he said, I just froze with horror because Pete, he said, I felt like a thousand eyes were staring at him. And he said, oh, well, we, we just walked straight out, of the stra straight out of the station. So I got to all, and I went and had a coffee. And I sat there having a coffee. <clears throat> and... By this time, I'm feeling rather hungry and actually tired. And I worked out that I wanted to be able to get the overnight uh, train. So I got out of uh, two hours and get the train to Singen, which is where the escape has obviously went to. Got in um, to Singen. I thought, I ain't sleeping under a railway bridge or a bush. But two Navy officers, they were cold, it's escaped. And they spoke German. And they booked in to actually middle class hotels. Middle class? Like, no, like middle class. Oh, sorry. Middle, sorry, my sorry. apologies. So I thought, I ain't sleeping under right white bridge. Using my German, I knocked on the door of a hotel and got a room um, for the evening. So I booked in. Where did you learn German? Army in Germany. In, so in 1941? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's also escaping. <laughs> anyway, I left this hotel. And another guy who'd been there uh, to cold it, a mate of mine, he said, right, how to get over... All the, all, all the escapers headed for Ramsen over the Swiss border. So... He said, go along the road called the, the N34. Go at least um, five clicks. Go to a place called um, Speeshoft. Head down there, and that leads um, to Ramsen. What the escapers had was an escape map. And it was hidden in, like, books and everything. The escape maps n never showed the uh, Swiss border. Because if they got captured and the map got uh, took off them, the Germans would know all the crossing points. So there was one main, obviously, map in Colditz. So the guys had to, to like, memorise it. So I could have easily switched on to Google Maps and all that sort of stuff. So I walked out of the hotel and I, like, I like, memorised all this route. But unbeknown to me, when I walked out of the hotel, it was foggy and misty like anything. Found the N34 and used my after button compass. I knew I was all right. Yeah, well you showed me that before the podcast. Where did you get that button compass from? I bought it online. Is it like a replica of what they had? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I wanted a real one. They're about obviously five hundred pounds or something like that. Yeah. How did they make? How did they make the compasses? How they make? Well, the compasses, as you can see here, I've got my pipe. The reason why I've got my pipe, because MI-9 will actually smuggle compasses inside the actual pipes. Do you smoke a pipe? No, I don't. Where did you get that from? Um, you know who smokes pipes? Who? Jared. 
Does he? That wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. That wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. Mate, it's never been any tobacco in. Well, no, it's not. It's a replica one. It's it's not a. Hey, How did they make the company? Well, all the compasses was actually made by like like magnetising needles and stuff like that. And that's how it does. And the compasses were actually hidden. If you get a box of matches and you can get all the matches and you glue them all uh, together, you then stick a compass in a box and stick all the matches on top of it. So if anyone opens it up, it looks like... And a lot of the RAF uniforms had a button compass in their buttons. Um, so I saw this sign, the big sign that said... A Schafthausen CH. CH is an abbreviation for Switzerland. So I thought, ah. And they said underneath, uh, 21 kilometres. I thought, right, I can't go wrong. So I started heading off, thinking, Ramsen is going to be off over to the left. It just misses anything. You couldn't see any signposts, anything like that. And there was a track on the side of the N34. So you've got the N34 there, and the track was going over. It was a cycle uh, track, a small stream and a railway. And I saw this train going obviously past me. I looked at the train thinking, I wish I'd done the same as that fucking French officer and just uh, jumped on the train. So as I'm walking down, Schaffhausen, 18 uh, kilometres, and I was trying to do a time appreciation, all that sort of stuff. Starts walking, starts walking. Schaffhausen, 16 kilometres. I thought, right, it doesn't matter now. I made in with a Schaffhausen or bust. So I starts walking. And he does get lonely. And you can imagine how a prisoner felt on only, only a little food. He hasn't gotten a, a map of the Swiss border. He's obviously probably been hunted. He's hoping that people don't speak to him. So I went past uh, two workmen who said uh, good morning uh, to me. And I went, uh, I'm the Ramsen. Uh, oh, that's it. They asked me if I was going to Switzerland. I said, yeah. I said, oh, I'm the Ramsen. Ramsen? Nay, hey, Ramsen. Links. Off to the left, these mist-coloured hills and mountains. I thought, I'm not backtracking. I kept going. And this point, I was like, it had shaft out and five kilometres. And I was thinking, I'm going hungry now. This is getting a bit special. What kept me going was the fact that a good old, like Mikey Valance had said, why don't you start up a Just Giving page? On the Monday morning, I'd raised £636 for the Royal British Legion. So I kept going. And it is a lonely, you know, you start to think, I don't know, hardly any food, hardly any sleep. Kept going. So I ended up in a little village. No signpost on it. And then I saw a little sign, a cycle uh, track, shaft dozen, three hours. By this time, I'd, I'd started off at 8 o'clock in the morning again. It was now like quarter to 11. I thought, I need to do a map check. So I thought, right. And I saw a sign, barn off station. So I walked over to the station. I saw this map. I thought, I'll ask inside. I walked around the front of the station. It wasn't open. I was like, this. Oh, Jesus Christ, here we go. I went, I went around the corner. I just... I had on that that German replica 1940 pack, which was packed full. It must have had about thirty pounds in it, and it's as you can see here with its leather straps. It's not the most comfortable. And I just looked up as if to say, "Oh Jesus Christ!" And looked down these railway uh, tracks, and as I looked up, I saw this German flag. But next to the German flag was a Swiss flag, red flag, white cross. And it went way top. And I looked up and there was a Swiss flag. 
I thought, hang on a minute. Other side of the railway track, is that Switzerland? So I went back and I saw this lady. I saw in Schulingen's bitter. Is das, excuse me, please. I went, in Schulingen's bitter. Is das uh, Switzerland? She went, Swiss? Yeah. And uh, Switzerland, is das Switzerland? Yeah. I went, um, Spraken's English bitter? Yeah. Is it Switzerland? Yes. Oh my God, I've made it. Where have you come from? Called it Sir Castle up near Leipzig. And I was like, oh my God, I've made it. And she introduced me uh, to this guy, uh, Damien, I think his name was, a Swiss guy, spoke excellent English. And I said, look, I've got to get to, I was off um, to actually stop an old army mate who lives in uh, Switzerland. I have to get uh, I'm to Zug and he showed me how to actually get a ticket and I got on this uh, train. Now, even though I'd had human contact, but I'd not spoken uh, to anyone, and I opened up a little piece of this uh, a chocolate as a celebration thing, had some water, and he asked me where I'd come from and I told him. He said, oh my God, what an adventure. Um, I've now raised up to, up to a thousand pound the Royal British Legion. Awesome, mate. Well done. And that was it, mate. I mean, it was just a fantastic journey and an adventure. And it was, I achieved all my goals. But I think it showed that, you know, all these guys who did it, if you talk now about escape and evasion, everyone, you know, as soon as you say, oh, escape and evasion, everyone thinks, oh, uh, special forces. You know, caught in an ambush. All these guys were like gunners, navy, off subs, artillery, not fit. And they just, on all any rations, but the will to escape, get home. You know, it was just, you know, and I was in their footsteps almost. And it just f f felt, I felt humble, really humble. Mm. Awesome, mate. How long did the whole journey take from start to finish, from Colditz to, to Switzerland? It took over 24 hours. And even though I spent a night at the hotel, it was, I slept and I didn't sleep. What do you mean? Because all my mind was going through all the route. It was going, right, I need to do this, I need to act, actually do that, I've got to go that route, I need to, I've got to go off to the left, I was trying to memorise names and stuff like that. And you've done, obviously, escape and evasion exercises and stuff like that, you know, when you, you've had hardly any food and you're tired, you're not thinking straight. And you look at your watch, you think, hang on here, if I cover... 4Ks an hour and all that sort of stuff. And it was just, it was interesting, yeah, an, an in, um, uh, incredible experience. And, you know, to all in the footsteps of these guys who they must have felt when they get over to Switzerland, like, oh my God, I'm, it was a neutral country. So what was the process for them when they got to Switzerland then? Did they just give themselves to the authorities then? Or when they got um, to Switzerland, they, they got took to the embassy at uh, Geneva, which unfortunately I wanted to, but it's closed down. Now it's in um, Zurich. But I went to uh, Geneva anyway. They went there. They actually ascertained who they actually were. They actually could have been a German spy. So they had to check them all out and everything like that. But then they got obviously debriefed. But they then they then had to get out of Switzerland. Airy Neve got took from Switzerland back into France, which was enemy occupied by the Germans, handed over um, to the um, the resistance. And there's a line that they um, set up for prisoners called the Comet Line. So they took them from France all over the Pyrenees then into Spain, which was a neutral country. Agents met them in Spain. They then got them over the border at uh, Gibraltar. And then 
of a troop ship or um, flown back her to England. Then once they got back her to England, MI9 had interviewed them at the uh, Langard Hotel in London, Earth Marleybone. Get them in, have a chat with them. What did you see? Right, what route? And that. What actually paperwork? What actually checkpoints? Where's there a good uh, crossing point? Airy Neve was later involved in Operation um, um, Pegasus. Have you heard of that? Which one was that? Arnhem. Oh, Arnhem, yeah. Well, after Arnhem, there's all the prisoners who were trapped. They set up escape escape oh, lines. That was Operation Pegasus, mate. That was Market Garden. No, no. After Operation Market Garden. I have my fucking mind going out thinking, have oh, I just got that wrong? No, no. Yeah, okay, so Operation cool. Market Garden. But when obviously Market Garden obviously failed, they then set up Operation um, Pegasus where MI9 went over to, I think, Holland and they got all the guys across all the Rhine escape lines. So they sent parties over our um, uh, to the Rhine and they guided all the prisoners or the escapees back. He was part of that. Who was that? Who was that guy talking about agents and double agents and stuff? Who was that dude who was a double agent for us and ended up, he, he, he parachuted back into the UK, didn't he? Garbo. What, who was it? Who was it? I think it. Uh, uh, are you on about Garbo? I what was the operation called? I don't know the operation, but he was a German agent. Yeah. And, and they turned... codenamed him Garbo. And they turned and he sent the Germans false information that there was um, the general um, Patton had his army forming up at Norfolk. And they had inflatable tanks and f fake aircraft and landing craft and all fake um, signals. And he sent back fake information and the germans had put spies in in over uh, to britain and they were they're actually taken over to the um the tower of london and they were obviously given a choice of basically you'll work for, for us or send and send information back if not obviously spying is treason and it's execution didn't he parachute back into the UK or something? Yeah. D didn't he? Yeah. For the Germans. Yeah. They parachuted him in and he, as if he was, uh, like, secretly, didn't they? They yeah. chucked him out. They chucked him. I'm, I'm butchering the story. People will know this because yeah. it's a famous one. And then, yeah, parachuted in, even though he's already turned at that point. So, yeah. He, he, yeah. 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 Crazy fucking stories. Second World War. Oh, crazy, God, Crazy, yeah. crazy stories. Just unbelievable. Different, different world that was. Wasn't it? I think it was more. In certain areas, it it was a more um, um, chivalrous uh, time. They actually used to have a gentleman's agreement in Colditz, where they would obviously take all the officers that don't have to the gas house, otherwise known as the actual pub, and have a drink, as long as they obviously didn't escape. The Germans and the British officers. Yeah. Uh, the Germans and the Dutch officers. No, uh, British. We'll take you over to the pub as long as you don't escape. The Germans said that to the British? Yeah. <laughs> How mad is that? And I, I mean, there used to be a dentist down uh, town as well. And they actually went down uh, to the dentist and they had um, two guards and it was a foggy evening. Right, One of them, he did a leg, he legged it, he ran off. And I think all four of them did, they just went, poof, bomb bursted out. And they want to shoot because they might um, shoot as a civilian and stuff like that. <laughs> Some of the stuff that they thought of. Another one, he, he pole vaulted over the back fence. He just found a pole and he went right pff, over the back fence. I wonder how many... It'd be, it'd be, imagine the conversations that go on between old, you know... POWs of the Allied POWs and German officers who they've relinked up with. Oh, imagine that. Imagine I mean, that, that must be like. Imagine being a fly in the wall in those conversations. Oh, it's God. a bit like um, there's the story of the sub, there's a sub a, uh, an Argentine no 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 British submarine commander and the Argentine which was was it the Belgrano yeah and the Argentine captain of that ship and they are in comms aren't they yeah. 
there's a, I, I think I might be wrong, but I think they've pres they've given presentations on it together before. The sub commander and the fucking Belgrano captain. I might be wrong there though. When I, when I was growing up, there was um there was a, a Second World War veteran, and his name was Gwyn. Um, uh, Welsh boy, obviously, and he was the navigator for a Lancaster. And yeah. it's the, it's the la I, then back then it was the only one, only Lancaster that was still intact and flyable. It was called mm. Friday the Thirteenth. Mm. It might still, I would expect it's still in existence now. Yeah. Whether it's flying or not, I don't know. But he, his venom for anything German <laughs> at a time when little was coming about. A, he he lived in Kreinand. Mm. Um, I'm assuming he's not alive anymore. This is 20 years ago. I might be wrong though. And um, he lived in Kreinand. And I remember um, a little getting built was built in Neath. The first little in Neath, which loads of German produce and stuff. And I don't is is little the German company? I think so. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if it's German, but loads of German produce. And uh, his missus didn't give a shit like about any of that. But if she, he'd be like, "You don't give you, you don't go there. You don't give me anything German." I remember she used to. There's this chocolate that he liked, and she only yes ever used to give it to him without the wrapper on, because it was this German chocolate from Little B. Fucking loved it. She would take the wrapper off and go there you go. But his uh, he was a good guy. But yeah, he's like he was talking about people getting on there with with their the people they used to fight, and then you got like people like Gwyn who just like. Phew, could never ever, but you can understand it yeah you can understand having that uh, that utter contempt utter contempt you can understand it for someone who was there yeah you know the utter contempt for what went on but then i've always wondered are you i mean i've always wondered what what it's like to be a fly in the wall in a german household of a family and that topic comes up you know with kids or in whatever context just to just to hear what it's like because just to hear what it's like it's just like i, I mean know. a lot of the stuff that obviously came out of cold it was also the, the the actual flyers who they they because obviously dresden got obviously firebombed and we bombed a lot of cities and they bombed us but for a flyer who got bailed out and he got caught, it'd have been taken through all the ruins. It'd have been ripped to shreds. And it was... I, I think that they saw two signs of the war. Now, I know obviously my obviously great-uncle. He's met... He, like, knew a German guy who was a soldier in World War Two, And they got on great. They actually kept in touch. And you do hear about it. Without being in obviously politics into it, I don't think I want one to speak to, to an IRA obviously terrorist, and I won't want to speak, and you won't want to speak to a, you know, um, it was a different era. It was a, di it was, I won't say it was actually shiver. It, it wasn't a chivalrous, but it was like. A soldier's war? I think I would. Like. I would. I'd be quite happy to. I, so I actually, I say I'd be quite happy to. I I have, over the last couple of years, uh, not for at least the year, but year before last, I was I, I was putting the feelers out to to get someone from Northern Ireland mm. conflict, conflict, whatever you want to call it, campaign on, yeah. as in an IRA member on, to discuss. To discuss what? I don't know, yeah. but that's what I thought. Pfft. But then, I don't know. But then I know that there's a guy called, uh, a journalist called Dom Nichols. He's ex uh, Power Rich, mm. but he's a journalist for, oh, I don't want to get this wrong, one of the broadsheets, yeah, right? Yeah. And he um, he's recently interviewed a convicted IRA murderer. Mm. Um, and uh, I know that he was, I know they set that up to go and interview this guy. And, and and the this guy uh, see I'm not I'm trying to be careful I don't know if Dom yeah. if this story's gone out or whatever yeah. I've been released or anything but I know that Dom was um, he was he set this interview up with this guy who was a murderer and it was a high profile incident I'll tell you after after the podcast okay. high profile right at the time what what happened obviously Br British British soldiers and um, he was quite apprehensive he set it up and then he was quite apprehensive before and I wasn't even sure whether he should be doing it or not you know and uh, and it depends it all I mean those questions 
it all depends on the reason you want to talk to them. Ignore mm. ignore ju- journalists and podcasts and all that, right? Yeah. The reason you want to go in and talk to them, um, who it is you're talking to, you know, what 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 their feelings are on mm. what they did or didn't do and the situation of it all, because it probably wasn't the same as it, as it was back in the time when they did whatever they did or what they were took part in whatever mm. they took part in, whether it was an attack, whether it was a the, this the victim of an attack, yeah. whether it was a fucking murder or whatever. I don't know. It depends what you want to get from it, and depends uh, certainly from a something where you put out the public domain perspective, like a podcast, like a news piece, like a news story. Mm. You know, it depends what the the benefit is for the public receiving it. Mm. You know, it's a challenge, mate. Because yeah. there were some topics, there were some organisations where at the moment, if you went and you got one, got someone on to talk to them and gave them, give them a platform, you know, that old expression, oh, you give them a platform to talk, him or her, give, give them a platform to talk, fucking hell, the kickback would be horrendous, the <laughs> kickback would be horrendous, you know, I mean, well, having said that, when you talk about the Taliban, for example, arguably, a lot, it'd be a lot easier to do now because they're almost getting some form of legitimacy mm. in the eyes of the public, it's been, they are, they are getting it, they are, they are they are being legitimised in the eyes of the public mm. as a as a voice as an organisation, a formal organisation with um, with uh, which it doesn't seem like they're going to be made to go away anymore. Mm. You know, certainly we look at the way they're being treated. But what the fuck? <laughs> your your studio. The for, camera's on you when I do this. Your, that's the heat. That is the the. the Right, if you can't see this, ladies and gentlemen, the studio is falling no, apart around the, uh, us as we no, speak. Don't say that. It's <laughs> not falling apart. No. Let's see uh, the piping contain all the cables. Because uh, it's got it warm in you. So the glue. Can I... Anyway, that's can, my excuse. Can I... We need to knock it on the head in a minute. Well, can I quickly tell you about the, the cold it's cock? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Hugh Keir has just gone silent Go all of a sudden. Go uh, the words of the cold it's cock. Go on. So what just the brought the conversation down and not. But it's just gone down. What the cold it's cock was. One Have e- you been hanging on to this since the part of the podcast? Yes, I have. It's uh, the, the start, pe- not the part. The, the yeah, it's, the, podcast, it's yeah. the pierce de resistance. So one evening in Colditz, 1943, is the winter time. Two RAF officers looking out of the window, and they notice the snow isn't falling down. It's actually falling up due to the thermals. And it was in a blind spot right to the top in an attic. So an idea came about of basically having somehow they thought of building a glider to get two people out. And they nicknamed it the Cold It's Cock, and it was made out of bed sheets, pizza, um, the bits of wood. They put a false wall up in the attic of Cold It's to do all the the work. Now there's now a strip of uh, tape on the floor where the false wall was, and according uh, to our tour guide Steffi, she said that people were actually going up there in the 1950s and 60s, and this false war was that well camouflaged that they didn't know it actually existed. How it was going to be done was, they would assemble this glider, cut a hole out of the attic, then on the apex of the roof, put down tables as a runway. The body of the glider would go out, then they would assemble the actual wings on it. To launch the glider with these two guys in, Jack Best and Bill Goldfinch, one guy would sit sit forward, one guy would sit um, right with his back. To launch it, they had a bathtub filled with concrete attached to a piece of rope. This piece of rope was then attached <laughs> to the nose of the glider. Oh my God. And the idea was that when they dropped the bathtub, it was on the on a pulley system, the the pulley system had to be double the speed of the glider. If not, the glider would take a nosedive. So what it was supposed to do was actually the bathtub would drop, the glider would go. This was all done in darkness, by the way. 
and they would have a release point and they had to get it bang on and there's now obviously a trial and error on this one and they worked out it would land all the side of the actual um, the river Mulder okay it was obviously never used cold it's got uh, liberated in April of 1945 by the Americans there was only one photo taken in the glider that they think it got uh, destroyed by all the townspeople they did an experiment in 2003 built a glider exactly to the specifications these guys went down uh, 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 um, uh, to the camp library and got a book on aeronautics and how aircraft fly all the dialect mentions built this glider and it's the actual uh, plans are kept in the in um, the imperial war museum and it was called the pink plans because it was done on actual pink paper and it flew it worked it flew but it, it obviously never happened but that's how ingenious these guys were but it wasn't the fact of as well that it would i want to escape in a glider it kept the minds active it kept them obviously, obviously busy and a hope and it was a project um, to actually work on you know what can we do let's build a glider what can we do let's start a tunnel right who's up for it <laughs> yeah quality awesome stories what's going to be your next trip mate um i don't know i've got a few of the things in the pipeline sort of having to think of it now i think i've had it i think i had a taste for it in cold it i had a taste for it in cold it um but I'll be doing obviously talks on cold it's all the money I raise from all the talks is going over um, uh, um, to the poppy appeal. Oh, hang on. So you are doing talks for people. People are paying you to do talks for cold it's now after that trip. Yeah. Oh, mega. Yeah. Mega. How do people get hold of you? Um, I don't know yet. I'm still going through the Tossy Pro. Well, I know how to get hold of me, but I'm still going through all that um, process. But if anyone's interested... I'll actually do a talk of my Colditch trip, uh, but all the money from the uh, ticket of sales I make will be going t towards the Royal British uh, Legion. I have been asked uh, by... I've got a contact out in Norway to give two 45-minute uh, talks on Colditz and the escaping, how they... more to point the escape for... Um, I think, well, it's for, I think it's pilots of the Norwegian Air Force going through a SEER training, survival escape oh, cool. uh, and the resist evade. If that comes off, it obviously comes off. It'll be a great, it'll be a great, obviously, um, thing and that. But, yes, I got. Are you on Facebook, aren't you? I am, yes. You're on Instagram? I am, yes. You're on Twitter? Yes. There we go. So people get hold of you on Instagram, Facebook or Twitter? Can't they, they certainly can. And uh, LinkedIn as well. And LinkedIn. LinkedIn. There you go. Perfect. Easy peasy, mate. Lemon Easy squeezy. peasy. Is your just giving pitch still open? It is, yes. It it is. So how do people donate? Um if you get in touch with me on any of those I'll No, you. don't say that. That's a pain in the ass. Okay. Like if someone searches if on you, just giving, what if should you they search for? Type in just giving Julian Woodall, Escape from Colditz, twenty twenty one. There you go. That'll I'll find come, it. That'll I'll find come it. up. There we go. Get online, it's, if it's still open, donate some money, buy your poppies, obviously, and then get onto one of these uh, Just Giving page and another way to give to the Royal British Legion. A Definitely. Fan, a fantastic organisation. Skills, Woody. Been a pleasure, mate. Thank you, Hugh. Until the next time. Until, until the next time. In another two years. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, dude. <laughs> Thank you very much. Cheers, mate. Bye. That's it. Thank you for watching the H Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear. If not, if it's not already appeared, uh, you can also, um, if you want to listen to the podcast on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Google Podcasts. It's everywhere. It's on all of the uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of Hey Chower. Becoming a patron of Hey Chower, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before 
it was on release to the general public and you also get access to uh, exclusive interviews which I do with each guest that last about five ten minutes that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of H Hour have chosen and each guest this one included gets asked those questions before the main podcast that's getting recorded it's like a pre-podcast interview lasts about 10 minutes and those interviews are really insightful really enjoyable nice and short and they only release the patrons they never, they never get released to the public i don't know why i had a little stutter there um you also get access to a Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away, give away gifts to my patron supporters. And it's all like, well, predominantly veteran-owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran-owned apparel, veteran-owned product services, and I'll give them away to my patron supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events. So you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of Page Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash HK podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N. Patreon.com forward slash HK podcasts. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q- Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.